Wyatt Earp's got nothing on him? No, not where he is. Okay, we're rolling. We're so happy today, friends, to have our good friend Larry Pratt. He's the executive director of the Gun Owners of America Association. And I tell you what, now, Larry is not just talk. I notice in his right hand, he has a, a new Colt Anaconda 44 Magnum, and I believe uh, I believe Larry's going to shoot some targets for us. Okay. And we'll have an editing break here. So. All right. So, sir, just take your time, and there you go. Just turn around and shoot them. All right. I'm going to stand here on the side. Just take your time. Hello. I've got a hard primer, that's all. Go ahead. We'll try it again. It'll probably go. <laughs> it happens. I may have a bad a bad spring on that. That's fine. That one's gonna go in a minute. All right, let's, <coughs> let's, I'm gonna have to, we're gonna have to take it in for warranty work. That's all right, that's all right. Huh, now isn't that interesting? I've got a light hammer fall. This is, it's gonna have to go and get a little adjustment. Good sir, buddy. One don't work, we'll get one that will. Well, let's... Ready? Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're very proud this afternoon to be here on our farm. Now, this is the last day of September on this particular day we're taping. And I guess, what, it's down to, what, about 95? <laughs> we have our good friend Larry Pratt here, and he's... Uh, uh, besides doing a commentary for the Gun Owners of America, of course, he is the executive director and will ha be having a lot of very interesting things to say. Three, two, one. So I'll know where I'm going to edit. One. We're very thankful to have Larry Pratt from the Gun Owners of America Association here with us this afternoon. Larry, of course, does a commentary for our programs, but more than that, Larry is also a shooter himself. So I think he has this 9 millimeter handgun that he wants to shoot a little bit this afternoon. So Larry, go ahead and have some fun there, sir. I'll even hold it for you while you put yeah. that on. Good. We look like real people. <laughs> All right. I would suggest just thumb and just whatever. Is it loaded? Yes, sir. It's ready to go. It is ready to go. Good. They're a little bit more reluctant on that one, aren't they? Well, the 9 millimeter is not a 45. <laughs> it's okay. I didn't miss that. <laughs> no, no. They're shooting high. Point me. Just got to learn where to shoot. And this is... This particular gun is a new Ruger P89 decock model. It's in stainless steel. And I think Larry likes it pretty well. I, I certainly enjoy uh, using it. It's a, a good target gun, certainly a good utility gun for a police officer or for the homeowner. And you know, Larry, this would be one of the very guns that uh, a lot of uh, the anti-gun groups are actually trying to take away from us. You notice this gun has a 15 round magazine it has a maximum capacity of 16 rounds with one in the chamber. And, you know, Larry, I just don't see a problem with you or I owning this gun. That magazine is the one that President Bush wants to ban, and many of the congressional uh, anti-gun leaders have been trying to ban. That's too much, they say, for the private citizen to own. Well, it doesn't uh, look very big to me. Well, what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, we got a good chance every time we have an election to do something about it. Ultimately, it comes down to who's going to be voting on these bills, 
and that's decided by who we vote for uh, in the elections. Now, one of the things that Gun Owners of America has been doing for uh, people is to provide a rating of the Congress so you can know who's actually been pro-gun and who has not. It doesn't matter what they say, we go after how they've actually voted. And we'll have it, this available for our members. We'll also be publishing this rating again this year in Guns and Ammo magazine so that people are going to be able to see for themselves how these fellows actually voted. Well, Larry, I think this is a good time. Let me take my ear protectors out and my safety glasses off for a moment. You know, friends, one of the first things you can do is join the Gun Owners of America organization. Now, I happen to personally know this individual right here, and what we have is a very fine, sincere individual who believes in what he's doing and knows how to get things done. And I think this is so essential. They are not concerned with, with giveaways, lotteries, other things like that. They have one thing in mind, and that is our rights as shooters. So that's the first thing we would certainly ask you folks to please consider joining the Gun Owners of America organization. I'll appreciate that. We, uh, we'll uh, keep them informed with a newsletter that goes out uh, throughout the year. and That way they'll know how the people in Congress have been voting in between the ratings. Uh, they'll hear about bills that are coming up, background as to what's been going on in the administration and in the Congress, and anything else really that's important on the national scene and many times on the state scene for those of us who want to preserve the right to keep and bear arms. Well, we certainly appreciate uh, Larry's effort in coming down here to Louisiana. Now, I'm, I'm a native here, and I, stand, I sweat just like everybody else. We don't perspire here, we sweat. The humidity level is probably about 87.999%. And uh, I'll tell yes, you, <laughs> <laughs> if, if people at home think these are beads of sweat, that's in fact, they're right. It's not raining, folks. This is... <laughs> It's hot down here in September, but it's certainly a good day to be outside and shooting sure and doing something sure. that we like to do, and it is so important, in fact, for our society in the long run. So, all right. Well, appreciate being here. So that made a nice thing. Good. Thank you. That looked good, didn't it? Three, two, one. You know, Larry, I've had this little Mini-14 for a while now, and I've always enjoyed shooting it. And I have a, a large capacity magazine that holds about 30 rounds, and am I doing something wrong here? Tell me something. Well, if the BATF, if the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms has its way after the end of November, yeah, uh, you wouldn't. Uh, also, the um, United States Congress uh, is working real hard uh, this fall, uh, as has the President of the United States, to get rid of magazines like that. They don't think that average people should have them, only the police and the military, kind of like in Soviet Union and other countries and other places of the world with governments that uh, have kept their people down. Well, you know, I really don't see the problem with this myself, and most people that have ever owned a gun, the only problems that we run into are with non-shooters and non-gun owners. Am I correct on this? That's, that's a fair statement. The people who are trying to legislate our firearms out of existence are non-gun owners and non-shooters. And many times, people that live in, in uh, houses with multiple locking systems and security, and some of these people can't afford to have bodyguards. Well, you know what, folks? The police cannot protect you if you can't protect yourself. You know that the United States Congress has its own police department. And it has more people in that police department than we have protecting our entire southern border. That gives you an idea how much protection they have. Now, this you're talking about the congressman in Washington, D.C. That is correct. They have their own, uh, in effect, private police department, their own cars, their own training, uh, everything, their own line of command, working just for the Congress of the United States to protect just those 535 individuals and their 30,000 employees, which is quite a few employees. Well, unfortunately, I don't think I would want that many police running the streets in, in the U.S. of A. watching everything I did. Well, right now, across the country, there's about a quarter of a million, about a, no, only about 150,000 police that are on duty at any one time to protect a quarter of a billion Americans. Obviously, that blue line is stretched way too thin to be able to protect us. And if we were to have enough police to protect us, you'd really need one per person. They can't That's be true. where you're going to be when you might right. be getting in trouble. That's true. So 
the idea that the police can protect us is an idea that is just simply not true. When trouble comes, we have to be able to protect ourselves. And calling 9-11 uh, isn't protecting ourselves. Well, if you look at the facts on how long does it take for a stabbing, for instance, to take place, just seconds, uh, if someone can is high on drugs or, or some other uh, terrible substance for, that has them physically deranged, uh, it only takes a moment to kick through a door. And we're not talking about a mansion with 47 locks on the door. We're talking about an apartment house where a single mother may live or uh, an older couple, someone who physically is not capable of withstanding the attack of a younger person or a larger person or someone uh, who's having tremendous psychological problems. Well, even a guy your size could have trouble if some goon breaks through who's been up right. on crack. Uh, he's not going to go down until you shoot him down. And if he sees the gun and you tell him that you're going to shoot him, many, many times that's not enough for these guys. You have to be able to carry that out. And if you're just bluffing on the other side of the door, that could be your last bluff. You know, Larry, as a private investigator, which I've been for many years, I've talked to a number of rape victims. And without exception, they said why I was told by, by so-and-so if they were unarmed. They said I was told not to buy a gun, to get a lock and call the police. And they said, I'm going out and buy a gun. The police can't protect me. I'm going to learn to protect myself. We know from work that's been done by Dr. Gary Kleck at Florida State University, he's a criminologist there, mm -hmm. that you are twice as likely to be injured if you do not resist than if you were to use a firearm to resist a criminal when he's attacking you. So the advice that's been given to women especially, but to all of us, that, oh, just hand them the money, just give them anything they want. Well, sure, you do anything you want until you can get your gun. And then you better do something with it because as long as you're at their disposal, they very well might kill you. Life is cheap in our time. You're exactly right, especially in some of our extremely crowded inner city areas. I've seen tape after tape of a convenience store robberies in progress, the tapes that were, were taken after the fact, and I've seen time and time again, whereas the people gave up their money and then the criminal, the robber, shot them or the robber stabbed them or in the case, uh, uh, of course, other horrible things have happened. Well, we're not saying to go out and, and literally start, uh, become a Rambo type or something like this. Uh, uh, and we'll edit this part here. I'm, I'm trying to get together what I'm going to say. Out. Okay. Well, Johnny, I would say that when people say that, are you saying that everybody ought to have a gun that's out on the street? That's uh, a question that doesn't have any consideration, and I would say any compassion, for those of us who are not black belts, uh, who mm -hmm. are not uh, big strapping individuals, who nevertheless have to go in places right. where we very well could be set upon, and to tell us that we shouldn't have a gun is to tell us that we should volunteer to be victims. And I, for one, don't buy into that. I certainly agree. I certainly agree. Uh, well, I think, hey, let's shoot this many 14, and let's just see how much fun they can be. You know, that, folks, that's one of the purposes of our program is to show how firearms can be fun, one, for the whole family, but they're great to relax with if they're handled safely and properly. So I think that uh, Larry happens to like this particular Mini-14 pretty well, and we have some ferocious water jugs. <laughs> Over here behind us, you'll see we have the ferocious hanging water jugs. We have a good shot of the attack water jugs there. <laughs> well, let's see what a basic Mini-14 with a 223 uh, expanding point bullet looks like on the, uh, this is the Larry Pratt Safari on the ferocious <laughs> hanging water jugs. <laughs> All right, let me, get my ears off. let me get my ears off. All right, sir, just push your safety off. It's ready to go. The attack water jugs. <laughs> okay. Pull your safety back on. That's uh, the trigger back on. That's good. Well, thank you. 
Now, I may, what I'll do is I'll show you. Why don't you hold that, sir? Would you just hold that in your hand? Okay, we're going And you can get your earmuffs. You want me to take them with us? Frank, yes, sir, please. Can you get us on, on camera? You know, Larry, I think we should make a point. And uh, there's so much misinformation around about the assault rifle, uh, the devastating effects of the assault rifle. Well, let's, uh, for instance, let me hand you this Mini-14 for a moment and hand me this 9 millimeter uh, handgun. Now, friends, let's watch the water jug over on the right. We're going to shoot the military issue 9 millimeter cartridge. And I want you to see, now, of course, shooting water jugs is not the definitive uh, demonstration of power or energy, but we're going to... Uh, use them as just one example of different bullet types and calibers. You know, Larry, uh, the media would have us believe that the 9mm cartridge is uh, sort of an, uh, an end-all, uh, terrible, uh, devastatingly effective round. Okay, friends, here is the full metal jacket uh, military edition of the 9mm. Now let's see the water jug on the right and let's watch what happens when we shoot it with your basic military 9mm cartridge. Okay, here we go. Now isn't that interesting? I don't think much happened, did it, Larry? <laughs> it put a little hole in the, in the case, but no, trust me, friends, can we get a close-up there, uh, Charlie? Uh, on the little hole in the uh, uh, jug there on the right. So much for the ferocious nine millimeter. Can we get a close up? Can we see that pretty well? Good, okay. Now then, let's go back. We shot the ferocious nine millimeter that some uh, of the good people in, in Congress would like to ban and a whole bunch of the news media would like to ban. So now then, let's... Uh, Let's try. Now, admittedly, this is a rifle. This is a 223 rifle cartridge. But hey, let's see what the military, this terrible assault uh, uh, round will do to this water jug in the center. Ready? Well, okay. Have to load it first. <laughs> well, certainly much more effective than uh, than the nine millimeter. But now then, let's look at your garden variety 357 Magnum with a 125 grain jacketed hollow point bullet out of the Smith and Wesson Model 28 which incidentally is one of my very favorite handguns. So let's, do I need to move this one in the center? You want me to move that one? Okay. We're ready? Not wet back here. <laughs> I'd say your 357 has a lot going for it, wouldn't you? <laughs> you got to run your whole day, I think. Boy. Tell you what, Larry, I believe, uh, and we're out by now. Ready? All right, this is your 44 Magnum 240 grain jacketed hollow point into a water jug. One water jug, it's easy to see. You can tell when you hit it or not. All right, watch it. Okay, not bad. Now, let's try the same 357 Magnum. Same. Uh, uh, exact same target. Can't tell much difference, can you? Huh? Very impressive. You know? So, anyway. Actually, three, two, one. I always give a little bit of lead time. Remember, it won't come on. When light comes on, tape don't really come on. 
Friends, we're so uh, happy this afternoon to be down here on our range in northern Louisiana. We have our good friend Larry Pratt, and we've just finished an afternoon of shooting. So did you have fun? It's been good. Well, we shot a what, 357, a 9mm, a 223. We, we shot a couple with magazines larger than 15, in fact. That's right, uh, something that the Congress thinks is a very dangerous thing for us to have. Well, we hope that we can change their minds about that. Yes, sir. Well, one thing, friends, uh, uh, a lot of people want to know, what can I do to ensure that my rights as a gun owner continue so that my children can enjoy the same rights that I have today? Well, let me say, how about consider joining the Gun Owners of America organization? Well, I appreciate that, Johnny. One of the things that folks would get when they join with us is our newsletter and every two years now we're uh, putting out a rating of the Congress so that people can see how these people have stacked up over the last couple of years and in fact during the two years uh, period between elections we'll be printing and have been printing how these guys and gals have been voting on gun uh, bills and I think that's really important because if people don't know how congressman have actually voted, they can be sold a line of goods, and you have no way to really know whether mm -hmm. the, uh, the representative is telling you the truth or not. Mm -hmm. So an informed electorate is really our best defense. Uh, unless we uh, have that, we're going to be with our back against the wall. And I think we really just need to get people uh, interested in finding these things out and not taking their word for it, because you could talk to uh, Peter Rodino, you could talk to Howard Metzenbaum, and he'd say, well, I'm not anti-gun, I'm for the Second Amendment, and for all I know, they believe that, but what they believe the Second Amendment means and what you and I believe it means, very different things, mm -hmm. and that you can only find out by looking at how they voted. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we believe that each individual should be, first of all, responsible for his own self-protection. The police cannot, in fact, protect us as citizens against the criminal element because one, the police cannot be everywhere at once. How many policemen at any one time did you say were available for the American population? Well, the total police force in the country isn't any more than 650,000. And at any one time, there's only 150,000 on duty to protect a quarter of a billion Americans. So obviously, they're not going to be able to be there when you need them. And it's worth considering that in law, their responsibility is not to uh, protect individuals. There was even one Supreme Court case that said there is no constitutional right uh, to be protected against murder. Uh, clearly, we're on our own. The job of the police is to be a cleanup crew. Mm -hmm. And that's not to disparage them. That's only to say that's the, what the facts that's, are. That's what the facts uh, in court have actually proven to be. You cannot sue them no matter how negligent some officer on some occasion might be, and happily that doesn't happen that often. You couldn't sue them uh, for love or money. Over a hundred years, we've had police departments in our country now, and that has uniformly been what courts have ruled, that there is no responsibility on the police department's part to protect individuals, only to provide law and order in a general sense. Well, you know, folks, this is one of the ideals of the shooting show itself. We want to show people, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of in wanting to protect your life or your property. There's nothing that is wrong or immoral. It's not or, Rambo to want to right. stay alive that's in right. a dangerous world. It's really not. Uh, Rambo is out looking for trouble. The average citizen is just trying to get from, a, uh, say, a hospital building at midnight through a dark parking lot that's true. to a car. And uh, to call that vigilante or Rambo well, those people ought to have their mouths washed out because that's a misuse of words. That's, they, they are trying to tar and feather law-abiding Americans who are simply trying to stay alive. And in today's society, unfortunately, there are a lot more criminals than there are police officers. Oh, but the good news is there are a lot more honest citizens than there are criminals. So you know what? If we can encourage our honest citizens to use guns in a safe and responsible manner in protecting themselves and their family and as well as for recreation will we'll be a lot further down the road. One of two things will happen. There will either be fewer crooks because they'll be dead or there will be fewer crooks because they decide it's too dangerous to That's work in that profession. Right. And so either one of those two 
possibilities is a good alternative. You know, as I've, I've worked as a private investigator for many years, and one of the things I have done in talking to criminals, people that have been locked up for burglary, for armed robbery, for other things, I'll say, well, how did you choose your victim? Well, they were weak or unarmed. No armed criminal, unless he's on drugs, does wants to approach an armed citizen. It just is not going to happen. If, a, if an armed criminal knows that there's a, a very good chance that he himself is going to be hurt by his actions upon the victim, well, he's going to probably uh, change his mind about the whole strategy and, not, and, and leave him alone. Right. That's exactly right. So we certainly appreciate you viewers out there watching us here being here with us today on the shooting show and we're so happy to have Larry Pratt down from Washington to do, do, do a little shooting with us and certainly have some fun with guns. Now it's been fun being here. Thank you very much. That was a nice spot. Okay. You know? Thank you, sir. All right. What do you want to do? Imagination. Oh, Those are names. No, that's they're, what they are. But they're, they're not too horrible. No, but they do stink. Do they will? Yeah. They just, they just chewing. Yeah. I must be such a sweet guy. Hey. Three, two, one. Uh, friends, three, two, one. Well, friends, we've come to a portion of the program which we're going to be doing periodically. If you have a question on the political scene uh, for, uh, concerning gun ownership, am I correct, Larry? Mm -hmm. All right. Here we have Larry Prant, the executive director of the Gun Owners of America Association organization that uh, you have members all literally over all over the United States. And you have uh, access to information literally all over the United States. So why don't you folks, if you have a question, address it on your envelope, ask Larry, and write to the shooting show, 554 Kings Highway, Shreveport, Louisiana. The zip code is 71104. And we won't be able to get to all the, the inquiries, I'm sure, but we'll get to some of them. We'll try and pick the most interesting question. And uh, please just write to Larry. Care of Three, two, one. Okay, that gives me a cue. Now then, Larry, why don't you tell us what, what's the gun owners? Tell us about the gun owners of America. Good. The Gun Owners of America was founded a little over 15 years ago by California Senator Bill Richardson, who at that time was on the NRA board. Senator Richardson wanted to have a, an aggressive organization that would defend our firearms freedoms in terms of the Constitution, in terms of this being a freedom issue. As far as we're concerned, the uh, right to hunt uh, is a very important part of the American landscape, but we're convinced that we need to uh, tell the legislators and really the American public in general that having firearms is part of the Bill of Rights. It's part of that package of individual liberties that was put into our Constitution by our founders to protect us from the government. And when we see the kind of gun legislation, let alone legislation in other areas of search and seizure, of jury trials, even of uh, our freedom of speech, we can see that it's not just the Second Amendment that's under attack. There is a great movement in our government uh, to simply forget that the Bill of Rights is in the Constitution and that it was intended to protect us from the government. The way a lot of people in the government think, it's really the Bill of Rights are there to keep them protected from us, but they've got it exactly wrong. And that's what shapes our whole organization from the beginning to the end. When we defend people in court through our Gun Owners Foundation, when we look at candidates uh, to support with our Gun Owners of America campaign committee, when we go lobbying with Gun Owners of America on Capitol Hill or in some state legislature, we're there uh, because we think the Bill of Rights uh, is still important and the Bill of Rights hasn't been rescinded. There's been no constitutional amendment to take away our Bill of Rights, certainly our Second Amendment freedoms. And that's why uh, we think the Gun Owners of America has an important role to play in articulating this very important part of the gun debate. We think that we need to go on the offensive and insist that it's past time to stop any compromises in the area of firearms legislation. We need to start talking about why 
handgun control, when they tell us that we need to wait for a gun or that we can't have a particular kind of gun, they're saying really that they've got blood on their hands for the people who've been damaged and even killed because of the firearms laws that are in our country, keeping people, law-abiding people, from getting guns that they have a constitutional right to have. That's what Gun Owners of America is all about. Is that? Good. Good. Gun Owners of America is a grassroots organization with members all across the country. They're our only source of support. We don't have industry support. We don't have uh, large foundations supporting us. We depend on grassroots gun owners across the country, in part because they're the ones that we are working with to be the real lobbyist on Capitol Hill, to be the real political action arm for the gun movement. They are the gun lobby, our members. And so we have kept our price low for $20 a year. One can join Gun Owners of America by simply uh, sending a $20 check to the address on the screen. You'll be signed up and you'll be getting the newsletter uh, once we get your name and address uh, throughout the year, which will keep you posted on what's going on in Congress and in the state legislatures and even sometimes uh, the city halls around the country, news that's important to gun owners so that you can be well informed knowing what's going on in your government around you. Well, you know, folks, we really have an interesting program today for you on the shooting show. And here at the beginning, we want to again thank Larry Pratt, our good friend uh, from the Gun Owners of America, who came down to do a little shooting with us. You know, it's important for shooters to get together and and just let the old gun go bang a few times and burst some water jugs and knock over some steel targets. It's such great relaxation and recreation and uh, certainly we've had a great afternoon today. Well this program I think you'll you'll really enjoy and Larry I want to say special mention you know we have some very fine uh, musicians and songwriters and singers on our program and you know what folks please remember them because you know their their uh, songs and music is paid commercials just like uh, the other advertisers on our program and these musicians are helping us bring such needed information about firearms certainly the things that Larry has to say they're helping us bring our message to you so please remember them we hope you enjoy our program three two, one, and now it's in. You know, you can rest assured that sucker's on. <laughs> well, friends, we've had such a great afternoon here this afternoon. Uh, welcome to the shooting show. I'm Johnny Rowland, your host, and this is Larry Pratt, and Larry Pratt and his organization, he's executive director of the Gun Owners of America, and he's a huge part of our project. They've certainly been helpful to putting us on the air and working with us. And another thing I want to mention for you, I think you're really going to enjoy our show today, but please remember our musicians and singers and songwriters, people that uh, will be playing a little music for you at different times during the show, because their paid commercials help us bring our message to you. And I think you'll agree, there aren't many shows like this on television. We're saying things that are, one, are true and really need to be said. We've got to inform, see, all we want is the truth, the truth about responsible and safe gun ownership. So please remember these fine musicians uh, because they're certainly making an effort to help us bring you our program. Hope you enjoy the show. Hey, this is Judy Will, a uh, top speed shooter, female. <laughs> I can say that, top woman, speed shooter, yeah. What's the correct way to say that? The uh, 1990 and 1991 Women's World Speed Shooting Champion. Worked for Team Smith & Wesson. Hmm. Well, it certainly works for me. Okay. Well, I'll introduce you, and we'll, and, and, uh... <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we'll have every loud car in the country come by while we're out here. Trains, too. True. Well, friends, this is your cameraman, Johnny, for the shooting show. Uh, and we're here this afternoon with our good friend, Jerry Mitchellick. And also, Jerry has a, a lovely lady on his left. And Jerry, who, who's with us here today? 
This is Judy Woolley. Uh, she's the uh, Smith & Wesson team member. Let me do that again. <laughs> of the female sort, you were going to say, yeah. female type. I didn't want to say that, but the way it went. <laughs> Tell me, Judy, how many people are on your team? Your shoot how many women are on your shooting team? There's only one team, or one lady. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you get that thing rolling. Three, two, one. Well, friends, this is your traveling cameraman today for the shooting show. We're very pleased to be down in the country below Shreveport, Louisiana, in Keithville, on the Clark Range, in fact, with our good friend Jerry Michalik. And Jerry has a lovely lady to his left with a a similar uniform to what he's wearing. So, Jerry, tell us who this is. This is Judy Woolley. She's the woman shooter on our team. And uh, she's the uh, reigning world champion woman speed shooter for the last two years. She's also the uh, IPSC champion in the state of Montana for two years. And I'll turn it over to her now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Hello, folks. <laughs> Well, Judy, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing in the near future. Okay, this weekend I, uh, we'll be going to a match in Dallas. And it's a regional tournament for the NSSF Chevy Truck Team Challenge. So Jerry Kay and I have been practicing the past few days and together as it is a three-person team event. I'll be shooting the uh, middle portion of the pistol event, so I'm doing what's called the action portion. And that's what I've been practicing here the past couple days on these larger steel targets that we have set up. Um, I'll be shooting actually a different gun than what I'm going to be showing you here, but this is a 9mm from the Smith & Wesson Performance Center. It is unloaded. Uh, it's, it's different from standard Smith & Wessons in that it has a frame mounted safety, more like the Colt type uh, firearm. It has stand, or, you know, two wood panel grips instead of the wraparound grip that comes on most standard guns. Uh, it's been lightened to be able to use really light loads very comfortably and it has a, a pro point. It's an electron type of electronic sight that a lot of competitors are using. Um, all it shows is a when it's on you just see a red dot through the tube you put that on your target it, and it doesn't have to be the red dot doesn't have to be centered in the tube wherever the dot is that should be where your bullet goes provided you do things right. Um, so it's a little faster and easier than lining up sights and going back and forth visually from the target to your sights. Um, well, that sort of sight is really gaining popularity throughout the action shooting games, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got them on several of my guns right now, and I'm enjoying using them. Well, now here's another question for you. Uh, can the folks at home who see this, can they order a gun similar to that from the Smith & Wesson Performance Center? Similar, yes. Um, not quite like it. There's The team has gone with, we've, we're pretty particular about what type of firearms we like to use in competition as most competitors are. So it has modifications that are available, really a few that are available only to the team members, um, probably for liability reasons, right. I would assume. So this is, you can get something real close to this, though, and from the Performance Center. Well, Judy, let me back up for a moment okay. and ask you, and uh, uh, let me ask you, how did you get started in competition shooting? OK, I started uh, competition shooting Let's see, in 1985, when my husband, whom I'd been pushing to start a new, pick, take up a new hobby, um, decided that he wanted to go wild boar hunting with a handgun. And he figured the best way to find out that his firearm worked flawlessly was uh, to get into competition and test it out. And I thought if he was going to get ammunition, I should get ammunition for myself also and have the opportunity to do some handgun shooting. So I started in 85 with a 4-inch Ruger uh, Security 6. And uh, following year, went to a six-inch L-frame, which is a gun that Smith and Wesson makes. And then went through a series of semi-automatics until this past year, when I signed a contract with Smith and Wesson, and now shoot strictly Smith and Wesson handguns. Well, we're so glad that you could be here with us, and uh, uh, I'm going to stand up and take a uh, view of some of the things we'll be shooting in just a few moments. You'll be shooting some steel targets for us, I believe. Am yeah, I the 12-inch steel plates that we have set up here. There's a field of 10 plates. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And at this competition, we don't do any shooting from the holster, which we do a lot in competition. This is strictly where you, it's a tag team event where we'll have to uh, tag a start signal. Uh, Jerry will proceed to uh, his portion of the event where he'll have to fire a minimum of 20 rounds on with a 22. 
come back, tag a, the start signal again, then I'm able to go out and do my shooting, and I will have uh, 10, they'll actually be knocked down targets of various sizes. When I'm done with that, I'm, I, we all have to unload and show clear too uh, before we can leave our firearms on the table. Uh, go back and tag the start signal for Kay Clark to go out and do her portion, which is a, at 35 yards and it's a precision event that she has to do. So the good news is this uh, uh, team event, you and Kay will be shooting with each other rather than against each other. Yeah, and we enjoy that too, <laughs> so everybody knows. Um, <laughs> Kay and I, I feel Kay's a good friend and it's been a lot of fun meeting her and knowing her and getting to shoot with her and against her. We both want to see each other do our best and we both want to beat each other at our best. <laughs> so, so. Well, I, I do want to mention here this wonderful Louisiana weather we have. Aren't you enjoying our nice sunshine here in Louisiana since you're from <laughs> Montana? And of course, it's severely cold up there. <laughs> compared oh, to nah, us. nah. It's actually, you know, this time of year we're actually still about as warm as down here. It's just quite a bit drier, so it's it's more comfortable type of heat. Well, we're certainly pleased to have uh, the opportunity to come down and be with you folks today, and I know we're going to enjoy watching you shoot. Okay, well, thank you. On Saturday, uh, we have to shoot 22 rifles, shotguns in a variety of situations, and our, and our handguns. So we have to work on our versatility also. Well, we would like to add, and I, I think that Mike's going to pick me up, and we'll just if we use this time, if, we, if it turns out, I think we will. Of course, uh, folks, let me mention again Jerry Mitchell, whom we had on our programs earlier this year. And I think I can say this without qualification, the world's fastest revolver shooter. And we were just uh, uh, talking a moment ago when Jerry first started attending national matches, when he walked up to the line with his revolver, I mean, I'm sure there were people who said, oh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> but he has certainly proven uh, what can be done with a whole lot of skill and a, a tremendous amount of determination. Well, sir, uh, what have been the high points of this past year since we've seen you? Well, we've done a bunch of demos over in Bisley, England. That went well. We had a big turnout. We were shooting for about a thousand people a day. And uh, they went really great. Well, I'm sure that was fun. Uh, uh, it was different, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I believe you unofficially eclipsed one of Ed McGivern's records over there. Am I correct on that? Correct. Well, sir, hopefully we can get you up here and shoot a little bit for us today. We're certainly looking forward to it. Okay. And again, so glad to have you with us today, Jerry. Thank you. Can we do it? We can do that. Let me start you on the time. That way we get it on the spot. Okay, now I can step behind her also. Uh, we have to have one of these microphones because the uh, gunfire kills. Uh, okay. Well, boy, these here will do. So. Heck, we've probably played music a lot of industrial music. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Never enjoyed it playing that loud, but. Those clouds in your state, that's great. A little lower than the barrel. <laughs> Would you rather use a barrel? No, this one. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, we're in. Okay, shoot it ready. Stand by. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was 15-9. You ready? Stand by. Ten point seven seconds. That's uh... now. This is Judy's ten millimeter pistol. She's using right now, and it has uh, a dot type. Uh, site. It also has a hybrid compensator system on it, and it's really going to be interesting. Judy's one of the few people who are using the tin, but uh, as we uh, were talking earlier, it certainly works for her. Okay. Shooter ready. Stand by.
Eleven point two. Later trigger? Yes. Okay, we're on. Okay, what we're going to do next here is shoot the uh, 22 segment of the uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation uh, team match, also known as the Chevy Truck Challenge. Uh, what we have here is a Ruger 1022 that's been reworked by Jim Clark Jr. And what we have is a, a Douglas barrel, a premium air gauge barrel, and a, and, a, and a super trigger job. And these guns are pretty much capable of shooting under an inch at 100 yards, and which is good because some of our targets is, is really about a one inch target at, at 90 yards offhand. All this shooting is offhand. And uh, Judy's also has a Clark Ruger 1022. And what we're going to do now is go ahead and load as we would shoot the team match. And we're going to shoot the uh, 45 yard line, which is the, the close segment. Just, just to show you basically how it's done. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'm just going to start it with the timer. Okay, part of the, uh, the rules on this match is and there's no more than two magazines loaded with 10 rounds apiece. But you can have as many rounds of loose ammunition you want. You just have to load them after you have an empty magazine. The whole course of fire is uh, 40 targets. You have 40 targets to hit up to 90 yards away, and the total time limit is a minute and 45 seconds. The targets are a variety of sizes, and what we actually have to do is shoot through apertures to knock the targets over. Uh, they'll be color-coded at the match where we'll get different point values. The, the tougher the targets, the higher the point value. Uh, so it's it's a real challenge. All of it's done offhand, no slings allowed. Well, now, what about your ammunition? Are you using standard 22 long rifle ammunition or, or, or what? Correct. Usually in a match, we'll, we'll shoot Ely 10X which is a super match grade ammunition. Uh, at, 90, at 90 yards, you have to have ammunition at a group very consistently, and uh, Ely is about the only one we found to really work out that well. All right, well, we're going to uh, shoot these targets at this time. We've got to make Let me rephrase that. Jerry and Judy are going to shoot these targets. We as the cameraman here back in the background, so I think right. we're really going to enjoy it. We're going to run the short line again. You start with your rifles, safety off, action open, land on the table. And when the, the timer goes off, you have to pick it up, of course, and charge it, and then shoot your banks of targets. Let's, let's see how it looks. <clears throat> Let's see how it looks. Let's see how it looks. Okay. All right. You know, they were gone before I got zoomed in. <laughs> I'll set them up and you can zoom in on them while we, before we start. Okay. All right. I'm ready when you want. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Wasn't quite as good. And uh, certainly don't worry about any stumble or bobble. We say something called wheel edit. Don't worry <laughs> about that at all. I'd be fine. Okay. Well, here we are today uh, in Keithville, Louisiana, at Clark's Custom Guns, and we have none other than Kay Clark, daughter of. Uh, one of the best known gunsmiths and pistol smiths, especially in the world, Jim Clark Sr. And Kay works here in the shop uh, 
in her dad's company, and uh, she is a champion shooter, has uh, competed in silhouette, and certainly has done really well in IPSC shooting in the last, oh, several years, in fact. So Kay is uh, going to help us on our women's portion of our program today, so we're going to ask her a couple of questions. Kay, as, as a woman, what would you recommend to a new female shooter uh, to uh, think about as a first firearm or first handgun? Uh, first of all, the handgun you have is the best one. That's the one that's going to do you the most good. If you already have a handgun in the house, uh, a husband's or, or one's been passed down from your family, uh, learn to shoot it. Uh, if you're going to go out and buy one, there are lots of choices. I would recommend for a first time shooter a revolver. Uh, for a woman, probably a 38 Special. You can put hot loads in it. Uh, and a revolver is uh, about as simple as a as, as functioning handgun as you're going to get. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, jams or uh, very few malfunctions can occur with a revolver. Uh, however, if, like I say, if you have another gun, if you have a semi-automatic, there's uh, a lot of been said that you know women should just have revolvers because they can't figure out how to handle a, <laughs> an automatic and so forth. Totally untrue. Uh, whatever gun you have, a woman can learn to handle it just as well as any man. But uh, for starters, that would go for men or women. I would first recommend a revolver. Now, Kay, a lot of women are becoming interested in competition shooting, especially in IPSC. And why don't you tell us how uh, uh, for the ladies to get started in shooting IPSC competition? Uh, IPSC is based on, it was first formulated as a uh, defense uh, type uh, shooting. It was uh, based on law enforcement uh, training and so forth. Uh, so it's a very good uh, competition for a woman to get into, even if she doesn't really, not in it for the competition, but just for the practice. You can take whatever handgun you have. The handgun you're probably going to use, you know, in your home for defense, you can take it out and shoot it in the IPSC match. Uh, you may not, you probably won't score up there in the top with the people that are shooting really competitive guns, but you'll learn to handle the weapon well, which is uh, what the basis of IPSC is. But uh, if you really want to get into the competition part and be a, a competitive shooter on a national level or so forth, uh, you'll have to get a tricked out gun. Uh, Get you a good gunsmith to go through it, and uh, would you uh, recommend a Clark, uh, Clark custom gun for that? Would you? Uh... That wouldn't be a bad one. That'd, that'd be a pretty good choice, I think. Uh, that, of course, is what I shoot in competition. And uh, just got, uh, let's see, about three months ago was the Ipsic Nationals, where I, I looked into the high woman, uh, United States women's champion. Although I did get beat by a Filipino girl, and uh, uh, well, I mentioned that too. Uh, for any. A lady that wants to shoot competition, uh, you don't necessarily have to be, how should I put that, athletic. I mean, it's a, it's a fun match, IPSC is. It's a, it started out as based on supposed to be real life scenarios, uh, so you do a lot of different things. You, know, you run and, uh, and shoot around doors and uh, uh, go prone and so forth, things that you might have to actually do if you're trying to defend yourself in a real life situation. So uh, as far as preparing a woman for, for uh, an event uh, for an actual defense. Uh, it's, it certainly you know. it could it could be seen as helpful for for practice for for the real thing that ever yes, occurred. Exactly. That's uh, that's what it was based on to start with, and it still would. Uh, I'll guarantee you, if you go shoot an IPSC match, you'll be better prepared for the real life thing than if you had never shot one. Even though it is just it's a game, but it's it's uh, it can definitely gets you more prepared. Well, one thing I'd like to comment on uh, from the matches that I uh, personally have shot in and, and certainly have observed uh, the attitude that uh, the male, male competitors have toward the rim. Uh, and let's, I'm going to edit this. I'm going to restart that one more time. Yes, if I can get my tongue untied here. Okay. Okay, a point I want to mention is from the matches I have personally shot in and observed the attitude of the male competitors toward the, the ladies, uh, female competitors, is real good. It, it seems to be totally professional. Uh, there's no funny business that anyone would have to worry about taking their wife or, 
or uh, any problem of that nature. Is that what you found? Oh, yeah, definitely. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, uh, it should be a family thing. I, my kids go with me uh, to any of the local matches my kids usually go. And uh, even an advantage of having kids sometimes. Of course, at these matches, uh, there you have to you help run. You run tape targets and do other things while the other competitors are shooting. Uh, when I have my kids with me, I, there's any number of people volunteer to go take my turn to tape targets and score and so forth. It's uh, while I watch my kids. So it's <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and the men uh, and the women. If you go to an IPSC match, uh, you'll go up there, of course, not knowing what you're doing exactly. But ask anybody; they'll all be willing to help you and uh, give you maybe more help than you want. So. <laughs> Well, Kay, why don't you uh, give us an idea of what you personally are competing with? Uh, and I see you do have a couple of guns there handy. So why don't you just tell us what they are? Uh, this is a 38 Super, uh, model 1911. It's on a casting frame. Got a Colt slide. Uh, this is the gun I use for my uh, IPSC shooting. Uh, the hottest thing going right now is a, a scope. It's a red dot scope. Uh, also, right now, uh, most of the top shooters are switching to high capacity autos, which is 14 to 19 rounds. This one, uh, I haven't caught up with them yet. This is an, it has 10 rounds in the magazine, so 11 rounds total. Uh, but that's my Ipsy gun. Yes, and then I have uh, another gun. This is a 40 uh, Smith & Wesson. This is a 40 Smith & Wesson. Uh, both of these guns do have compensators on them. This helps reduce recoil. Uh, this particular one is used uh, for the Chevy Truck Sportsman's Team Challenge, where uh, last year I was on the winning women, women's team, and this year they'll have another women's category. And I think they're going to have, last year there were about six women's teams, and this year it looks like there's going to be at least twice that many, so it, it'll be a good match. And in that particular match, you shoot the uh, rifle shotgun in. Pistol, but uh, this is the one I prefer for uh, it's a precision event, 35 yards, uh, 10 shots, mm -hmm. in a small amount of time. <laughs> but it will also have a scope on it. I've got scope rings. I just haven't got my scope on there yet. Okay, we certainly appreciate you taking time to visit with us here, and I know that a lot of the ladies around the country will be encouraged by uh, watching you on our program, and uh, certainly they can learn uh, from from your actions and, and some of the other very fine lady shooters. So we thank you so much for your time and trouble today. Thank you. And here we are down at Clark's at Keith, Louisiana, and this is Jim Clark, Jr. And some of you saw in one of my earlier shows this year. And Jim uh, uh, is a champion shooter himself. Uh, he's competed for many years, but also, uh, he works at Clark's Custom Guns, and uh, uh, certainly they build some of the finest competition guns that are available uh, anywhere for that matter. So Jim's going to take us on a little tour. A lot of people don't know what a custom gun facility uh, is like on the inside, so he's going to give us a, a brief tour here of Clark Custom Guns, Keith, Louisiana. So Jim, why don't you just tell us what you're going to do here. All right, we're just going to go through the process of rebuilding the 1911 government model type frame. Uh, our main job is accurizing them. Uh, from the factory, out of a machine rest, they'll probably shoot in the neighborhood of a, of a 10 shot group around a foot. And before they leave here, it has to be under three inches, 10 consecutive shots. And that's our main job. This is our rack we work out of, and we have what we have is customer guns that send their own guns in. And of course, guns, new guns, we start with and rebuild. And as you can see from the tags, uh, we do guns all over the country and all over the world, uh, licensed exporters. Tommy here does all our revolver and 22 Ruger work. He uh, usually stays about three or four months behind just on 22 Ruger trigger jobs. Before we leave, I want you to talk about the uh, Sportsman Team Challenge rifle. 
Okay. We'll get back to those at the next bench here. And these are just some guns that are ready for bluing. And here we have some barrels, Douglas barrel stock that has been machined down to fit the uh, 1022s sporters for the Sportsman Team Challenge and quite a few 16 and a quarter inch for the squirrel hunters. We didn't anticipate the market uh, for the hunters and they're doing as much now as the uh, competition shooters are. Fluted for the weight, shorter and fluted for the weight, uh, 16 and a quarter and fluted. Uh, takes off about a pound and a half, which is a little heavy for, for a 21 and a half inch round barrel for the squirrel hunters. Yeah, now here's a 16 and a quarter fluted, and it makes a nice little package and it's not too heavy to carry in the woods. Okay, even on the squirrel guns, we still guarantee under half inch at 50 yards with uh, good target ammunition. Okay, we're a fairly complete machine shop. We have to do most of our machine work here with uh, lathe and mill work. Mr. Brandon here is finishing up some uh, 1911 barrels. These are in 38 super caliber. For the IPSC competition, yes, we do. Uh, in fact, we have a lot of trouble keeping enough barrels in stock. Well, of course, the para ordnance and, and, of course, the Caspians and whatever, they still use a 1911 type barrel, so that won't change the barrel market any. Okay, from the 16 and a quarter model we built for the squirrel hunters, this is the full competition model for the sportsman's team challenge, uh, complete with, of course, custom stock and same Douglas barrel, trigger job, uh, weaver bases, and so forth. Makes a nice setup. Laminated wood stock, a lot stronger than a standard wood. For a complete laminated stock finish like this one is, you're looking at $250. Not doesn't include the rifle, no. We've only offered these just recently, and so far they've been real popular. This is our drilling and rifling operation where we drill and rifle the barrel forgings. This is a brooch for the cut rifle barrels. And you can see it's just a series of a lot of little teeth and it's turned in rotation through this long broaching machine. Right, we get a solid blank. This is a deep hole drill machine where we drill the holes, of course, and then rifle them over here. Well, a lot of people don't have an idea of how the screws get in their barrel. And certainly this is how it's done. This is one of the best methods. In fact, I do like it. There are several different methods. Yes, this is called cut rifle. And you figure a little brooch like that's about $3,500. <laughs> Some of the things that you folks sell out of your shop that you uh, uh, say 
you specialize in or some of the things that you're best known for? Probably best known for bullseye type and IPSC or combat type pistols. Uh, this is our newest compensator, we call it. It is a recoil master, and this is at a 45. Uh, the IPSC shooters or the combat shooters are the people playing some of the money games use these type of guns. Uh, Steel Challenge, uh, Bianchi Cup, make Bianchi Cup revolvers, uh, IPSC sort of things. It's really a lot of fun. Yes, we do. Uh, anything from grip safeties to barrels to all oh, some different sites, machine checkering of frames, do all kind of work on them. Sure. If you want to call, the area code is 318, telephone number 925-0836, mailing address, post office box 530. Keithville, Louisiana, 71047. Thanks for coming.